So good morning, everybody. Welcome to um, the second Grand Rounds of the academic year. It's a privilege to introduce all of you to Dr. George Nasrallah. Uh, many of you may, uh, may not know George yet, um, but uh, you, sh you will get to know George. He's going to be a dynamo in our department. George um, did his medical school at my alma mater, Western in London, Ontario, and then his residency at McGill in Montreal, and we will not hold that against him. Um, and he's originally from Ottawa, as you might have heard earlier. George then came to Toronto for an Oculoplastics Fellowship um, with the Oculoplastics team here and completed that fellowship at the end of June. And he was subsequently recruited to join the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Toronto with a primary practice uh, based out of Mount Sinai Hospital. George has just been a fantastic um, colleague the last two years as a fellow, always available, always willing to help, a huge boon to our residents. And I think, you know, he's going to be a tremendous addition to our faculty. So um, I'd like to welcome George um, to this week's Grand Rounds, and I look forward to your talk. Thanks, Amadeep. All right, I'll go ahead and share screen. And Nancy's mad that I'm taking down McGill. <laughs> we have a, don't worry, Nancy, we've got a few McGill people in our faculty. It's okay. We, we don't hold it against you guys. All right. So I'll be presenting today on an unusual sinoorbital tumor. Um, thank you very much for having me. So the objectives of today are to know the differential diagnosis of sinoorbital lesions, and then um, spoil in a bit, but uh, to know the common characteristics of orbital lymphoma, the most common uh, presenting characteristics, and to know the broad management options of orbital lymphoma. No conflicts of interest. So I'll be presenting a case. So I uh, had an 87-year-old gentleman who presented with a three-month history of right-sided proptosis and periocular swelling. Past medical history significant for coronary artery disease, previous myocardial infarction, and dyslipidemia and hypertension. Those are his medications there, including aspirin. And um, he had an ocular history of uh, cataract surgery only. So on exam, his, his visual acuity was low on the right side, the affected side, but that's mostly from a cataract that he had. Um, and his visual acuity on the left side was uh, 2060. His intraocular pressures were fine. Um, his extraocular movements were limited on the right side. Um, I could not uh, uh, measure a proper Hertel's exophthalmometry because of the excessive edema uh, in the eyelids. Um, it just made uh, visualization of the uh, cornea very difficult from the uh, hertels. Um, on slit lamp exam, there was a lot of periocular edema um, and uh, chemosis and, and reddishness of the conjunctiva in appearance. The cornea was clear. There was no anterior chamber reaction or intraocular inflammation, and there was a cataract on the right side. Left side was previously operated on. So imaging had been done before I saw the patient. So could one of the PGY2s describe some of the findings on these images? We'll give them a second in the room. I think they're on mute right now. Okay. Sandra, maybe we can get that unmuted. There you go. Thank you. I'll give them a few seconds and then I'll start naming them. Okay. Is me? Oh, okay. <laughs> How about uh, how about Brian? Brian, are you there? Yeah. Uh, so it looks like a, a CT scan of uh, the axial slice of the orbit. Um, the first thing I see the in the orbit, like the nasal cavity, looks like a lot of I'm not sure like mucus or like some some congestion there, but then. Right medial to the right globe, it looks like a mass there. It's between the globe and the medial wall of that orbit. All right. And any comments about the globe position? The globe position, it, I'm not sure if it's like, it looks displaced. I'm not sure if it's like um, inferiorly. Yeah, well, that's it. It's, it's very mildly displaced. It's not, not very displaced, which is, Important to note in a lot of these lesions, it helps kind of uh, distinguish different kinds. Um, and so you're right, there does seem to be a lesion seemingly focused in the medial canthal region, 
um, and possibly involving the sinuses as well. This is another slice from the same CT. There's a yellow circle sign, a cousin of the arrow sign that is highlighting something. And um, I'm not gonna ask you, but we'll, we'll get back to that later. Um, can another PGY2 comment on the imaging here? Thank you, Chai. So uh, this is the MRI uh, of the axial uh, cut of the orbit and uh, the right orbit. So again, uh, the medial uh, between the the medial ward and the uh, globes, there's a mass there. It looked like so the density is the soft tissue density and the water is not clear and likely involving the ward. Uh, so the sinus and, and the uh, medium uh, orbital wall and the orbit seems a little bit uh, uh, pressed uh, medially and there's minimum displacement uh, of the orbit uh, laterally, like a temporary? So um, that's good. But a couple of things uh, that you have to be aware of is you can't really comment on tissue density on an MRI. The MRI gives you signal, uh, an MRI signal. And there's different signals depending on whether it's T1 weighted or T2 weighted. So on the left is the T2 weighted image and the right is the T1. So instead of thinking about MRIs as uh, uh, tissue density, think of it more as if it's hyper intense or hypo intense in T1 or T2. So this lesion, you can see that it's hypo intense in T1 and um, in T2 weighted imaging, it's kind of iso intense. Um, the other thing that you noted that was good is there is compression of the globe uh, on the medial aspect of the globe. That's also very important. Some lesions don't compress the globe and just kind of mold around them. Others do compress the globe. So it helps us a little bit in our diagnostic uh, conundrum here. And once again, the uh, yellow circle sign shows that there has, uh, there's still that previously noted lesion. Um, of note that these two scans between the CT and the MRI are about three weeks apart. So again, to summarize, we have a uh, process that's developed over three months and um, just a few weeks of interval shows some interval change in the disease process. Um, can one of the PGY4s comment on a differential diagnosis for what we have here? Let's try Ryan. Uh, sure. Um, so, I mean, the most common oral tumor will be lymphoma, so it'd be high on the differential. Um, you could have a, um, like a solitary fibrous tumor. Uh, you could think about maybe dermoids uh, in the orbit, but less likely in an adult. Um, you could have a, a cavernous hemangioma also common in adults. Um, you could have uh, something that's more like mucosal or sinus uh, invasion. So maybe like a malignancy, like a, a squamous cell carcinoma, you'd want to think about. Um, so those are all very good. Um, one way to, to narrow down the differential on an orbital lesion is to kind of break it down, whether it's infiltrative or it's well circumscribed. Um, and so um, in, in this particular case, we see that it's a more infiltrative lesion. And so you can break down infiltrative lesions in many ways. Um, and as you noted, there's, this lesion seems to be also involving the sinuses. And so then that also helps you kind of delineate. So do you know of other potentially infiltrative processes that might, um, actually not Ryan, I'll, I'll go to someone else, that might be involving the sinuses, but also the orbit? Um, and let's go to, let's go to Saba. Um, so I guess if it's like orbital and sinus involving, you want to rule out fungal, like if it's like mucormycosis, rhizopis, um, and then could also be 
uh, bacterial, like there doesn't look like there's an abscess, but as well. Um, and, and then remember also inflammatory processes, right? Like uh, granulomatosis and polyangitis um, often involves the sinus as well. Um, and IgG4 disease can also very rarely present this way. Um, so that's very good. So here's a list of differential. It's not exhaustive, um, but it does break things down. And one thing to one thing to help with um, with this is the uh, onset of the disease. So bacterial orbital cellulitis or acute uh, bacterial sinusitis um, can present in a, can appear similarly sometimes on imaging, although there'll be other signs. Um, invasive fungal sinusitis can. This is to be specific, a differential diagnosis of sinoorbital lesions. Uh, a mucosal usually involves both, IgG4 disease as mentioned, and GPA. Sarcoidosis can present in such a way. Osteomas and ossifying fibromas um, can uh, affect the nasal cat, the sinuses and the orbit. And then as mentioned, you know, invasive neoplasms uh, like uh, squamous cell carcinoma, esthesioneuroblastoma, and as mentioned, non-Hodgkin lymphomas can also uh, present in such a way. One broad way of helping to distinguish these things is thinking infectious, inflammatory, um, you know, fibrous or neoplastic. That's another way to, to kind of break down these uh, infiltrative lesions. George, I think you've got a question from Alan here. Sure. Uh, thanks, ahead, Alan. Alan. Um, uh, George, are there any systemic uh, symptoms that this patient was going through? Night sweats, um, uh, other signs of systemic uh, lymphoma, or is this just localized? That's a great question. So there were no constitutional symptoms uh, on, on questioning. Uh, there was no weight loss. Uh, the only, you know, quote unquote, systemic manifestations that were kind of overtly evident were the fact that there was a bit of a lump growing on the left temple, um, but no systemic uh, B symptoms. Hmm. Do they tend to get this down the road or is just a different presentation of lymphoma? Different presentation of lymphoma. Okay. Some uh, subtypes don't have as many B symptoms as others. And uh, in this particular subtype, it wasn't. So uh, the patient did see ENT and ENT thought that uh, you know, an orbital approach given the proximity to the skin and given the concern of necrotic change in the, uh, in the nasal cavity, that an orbital approach would be best for uh, biopsy. And uh, with the help of my very excellent PGY3 resident, we were able to biopsy the lesion and send it for pathology and came back as Epstein-Barr virus positive extranodal NK T cell lymphoma. So this is not, the usual standard lymphoma we get in the orbit, but more on that later. Um, and here's a little description from microscopy of note, um, pleomorphic cells, small and large cells, uh, single cell necrosis, and that large vessel uh, was, was, uh, was an entertaining part of the biopsy, but uh, we took care of that. Um, and then um, there was some immunohistochemistry done that helped in uh, uh, consolidating the diagnosis. More on that later. Uh, take note, though, of the strong CD56 positivity. So just a bit of overview on lymphoma. So it's a lymphocyte-derived hematologic can uh, cancers, uh, often associated with B symptoms, as we mentioned. There are two main categories, the Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphomas. Non-Hodgkin lymphomas make the majority of lymphomas and are classified as follows. Uh, mature B-cell neoplasms, T cell and natural killer cells, uh, neoplasms, precursor lymphoid neoplasms, and immunodeficiency associated lymphoproliferative disorders seen in patients who are immunosuppressed, either organ, uh, organ transplant recipients or whatnot. The Ann Arbor staging uh, is the classic staging of lymphoma still used today. And uh, it's what most of us learned in medical school. Um, the stages are there in front of you and picture to show, but basically a single region affected is a stage one, two regions on the same side of the diaphragm st uh, stage two, both sides of diaphragm is stage three. And if it's disseminated into non-lymphatic or extra lymphatic organs, then it's a stage four. Um, B symptoms help subcategorize. Uh, and if it's an extra nodal site, uh, 
um, like in the case of extranodal, which is the most common type of orbital lymphoma, there's an E. So orbital lymphoma is, a, is mostly containing malt lymphoma, but there are many other types of lymphomas that can present in the orbit. So uh, lymphoproliferative tumors usually affect adults in the sixth and seventh decade of life. So these are patients are more elderly. Um, the majority are non-Hodgkin and 80% are B-cell lymphoma, with the most common being uh, the malt lymphoma, which is similar lymphoma that happens in the GI tract. 35% of these orbital cases have systemic involvement overall. It's usually a slow progressing and painless process as it was with our patient. And it's important to note that because our patient, I don't have, unfortunately, unfortunately I don't have any photos of the patient, but um, when they presented, if you did not have a sense of the acuity of the presentation, it could easily be confused for an orbital cellulitis or many other acute uh, processes, but this was a slowly relatively slow, uh, I mean, relative, relatively slow progressing and painless uh, process. Um, the mortality of malt lymphoma is about zero to 20%. The presentation, if it's in the conjunctiva, uh, that's also a subset of orbital and you get the classic salmon patch appearance, as you can see in the photo there. These are painless, insidious, progressive. They can cause proptosis, although the proptosis is usually not very, very significant given um, that these lesions tend to mold around the orbital structures. Um, the patients can present with ptosis. Any patient with ptosis should have the conjunctiva assessed because ptosis, ptosis, not all ptosis is involutional and may be caused by a mass effect. Um, these patients may have dry eye, they may have diplopia, and rarely uh, malt lymphomas do, can cause decreased vision, although like I mentioned, very rarely. In terms of imaging, the molding uh, of the lesion around the globe and other orbital structures is a hallmark of the lesion and helps uh, distinguish it uh, even before pathology is done, although pathology is necessary. Um, the CT scan shows isodense and slightly hyperdense extraocular muscles, and there is mild enhancement with contrast. The mainstay of diagnosis of, or of all orbital lymphomas is biopsy tissue is necessary, even though the presentation may be typical, such in the case of a salmon patch or a salmon appearance of a conjunctiva. Uh, the specimen is sent fresh for immunohistochemistry and flow cytometry. Generally, um, it's a fine line of trying to resect as much specimen as possible to achieve a diagnosis without um, compromising vital orbital structures as these are in, uh, often infiltrative processes and overzealous biopsy may damage vital structures in the orbit, such as extraocular muscles, and that may portend to morbidity in the patient. Um, and then staging via imaging is uh, aids in diagnosis. Uh, management for malt lymphoma. There's no accepted guidelines for medical therapy. There's some new literature that seems to underlie a high prevalence of chlamydia, likely more like chlamydia satashi infections with a lot of these patients. And there is some evidence that treatment of underlying chlamydia, although it doesn't cure the patient of the, of the chlamydia, it does aid in remission of a lot of these lesions. Um, chemotherapy is not routinely used when there are solitary um, orbital malt lymphoma. And most malt lymphoma that presents in the orbit, about 75% are solitary lesions without systemic involvement. Radiotherapy in those cases is the mainstay of treatment with about 25 to 30 gray, um, although there are other um, protocols that attempt to use lower amounts of radiation and electron or photon beam may be used. And in our Canadian context, it's more resource dependent. Uh, we do not have a photon uh, beam. So I just wanted to highlight a bit about intraocular lymphoma because it can be confusing to some trainees and it's important to make the distinction. Intraocular lymphoma is a different entity than orbital lymphoma. Uh, it's most often diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And while systemic correlations of orbital lymphoma are the rest of the body, usually um, intraocular lymph primary intraocular lymphoma is mostly associated with CNS lymphoma. It's more common in women with patients being in the fourth and sixth decade of life. Um, 35 to 90% will develop uh, CNS lymphoma subsequently. 
Um, these patients often present with uveitis masquerade syndromes and an important fundus exam um, is, is necessary in, uh, in disting distinguishing between a, a true uveitis and, and a masquerade syndrome. Um, and then uh, here's a photo of a fundus with intraocular lymphoma and you have the classic leopard skin appearance that is often examined. Now, in our case, we have an extranodal NKT cell lymphoma, a nasal type. Um, it's a type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, usually uh, pre uh, present in the nasal cavity, but can manifest in the palate, skin, orbit, GI tract, and testes. 95% of these are associated with EBV. 56% um, have a primary treatment response rate, but there's a high recurrence rate. The median survival of these patients overall is about a year. The overall two-year survival is quite low. It's about 45%. The clinical presentation of these patients, uh, fewer than 20% actually have these symptoms. So many will not have these symptoms, as uh, is our case in, with our patient. Uh, they tend to present younger than malt lymphoma patients, and there's a higher male preponderance in these cases. They're also more common in Asian and Hispanic patients. Uh, they can present with facial pain or painless. They can have swelling, diplopia, orbital swelling, nasal obstruction, epistaxis, et cetera. For di diagnostics, immunohistochemistry is quite important. And CD56 marker may confer a higher risk uh, of uh, extranasal manifestation and lower response to treatment, as is in our case. Uh, as mentioned, EBV PCR is often done and pan imaging is done for staging. Um, in terms of treatment, there are no standard treatment protocols for this type of lymphoma given the rarity, especially when considering uh, orbital involvement. Uh, it is quite rare. Uh, unlike in malt lymphoma, local radiotherapy, uh, even in stage one disease, has a very high recurrence rate and is not the standard of care. Usually there's chemotherapy that is started, especially in the context of a younger patient that has more reserve and is able to tolerate the treatment. There are several different um, uh, chemotherapy regimen that have been tried. Uh, a more recent one is the SMILE protocol that has been used, but there's still a very poor prognosis with a lot of these patients. Um, Intraarterial administration of chemotherapy has shown some promise, but again, is very early. Regular follow-up is important in these patients given the high recurrence rate. Now, with regard to orbital involvement, there have been about 16 cases of isolated orbital involvement described in the literature, with only two recently. 63% um, received CHOP or similar form, uh, formulations. And the prognosis is actually worse in patients with orbital involvement. And it's even worse in isolated orbital involvement with a much uh, reduced survival. Um, most patients uh, had some form of decreased vision. And the reason for that is there's a higher rate of um, infiltration in, of the globe in these patients with NKT cell lymphoma. Thir uh, a third of them will have some form of uveitis, either AC reaction, vitritis, um, and it's possible to even have serous retinal detachments. Our patient ended up in the 69% who don't have some form of uh, ocular, intraocular involvement but it is far more common in these patients. It's, it's a very different entity than the malt lymphoma. So going back to our case, there was a staging um, done by PET scan and uh, systemic involvement was identified in the left temple, as mentioned previously, in the right arm, in the left buttock, in the left chest, uh, there were some uh, nodes and um, in the sacral canal. Um, this patient was a subject to, uh, was seen by uh, oncology, radiation oncology, and geriatric oncology. Given the advance in his age and comorbidities, the plan was for palliative radiation, but uh, discussion of care and follow-up is ongoing. So I'd like to acknowledge Jenny. She was an excellent PGY3 and helped quite a bit with that, uh, with this patient. Um, and thank you very much. Uh, do I, any questions about the case or about the condition? That was fantastic. <laughs> thank you for the for the overview there. There was just a quick comment from Yanni Ussel, who's one of our uh, 
ocular uh, pathologist here at the department mm -hmm. about just adding histiocytosis lesions to the differential, such as Rosal Dorfman disease, yeah. uh, which I think is a good point. But uh, thank you. That was a wonderful case and a good and a good example of how you know it's one of those things that comes up sometimes on exams where even the imaging can be suggestive of the diagnosis, right? And we don't see these very often. I know, you know, especially um, once we're out of residency, uh, I see less than one of these a year, probably. Yeah. Uh, but but it's a good reminder to, you know, for us to not just go by the report, but to actually take a look at the imaging and remind yourselves as to, uh, you know, how, how that, can, you know, you can, you can look at the, the way the lesion infiltrates the globe and come up with a diagnosis. You've got Jamie here. Uh, Jamie Oscar, any thoughts from you? Um, well, a couple comments. Um, you mentioned uh, the pathology doing uh, fresh, fresh uh, tissue, and it's often important to alert the uh, pathologist that that's coming, so that it won't sit in some back room and rot. Um, also, the importance the the treatment's complex of all these lymphomas, so it's really important to involve the hematology oncology people. Um, one quick question. You mentioned EBV. Is that going to be just uh, etiologic uh, in interest, or is there any uh, possibility of treatment? In the um, I think that there's a, there's a, uh, there's a strong uh, pathogenic uh, 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 value of EBV. I think EBV is very important in the pathogenesis of a lot of these lymphomas. Um, I think it's more to aid in the diagnosis, but I didn't find any literature to support treatment of EBV. I think uh, that's more just to aid in the diagnosis. Sure. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right. Um, oftentimes, we'll see these patients. In this particular patient, I actually did his uh, biopsy because the MRI was already done on the first day I saw him, and it's quite anterior. And it's important to time these things not at 7, 8 p.m. when when nobody's in the house. And uh you have yourself a fresh sample and you don't know what to do with it. Yeah, yeah. and also, I mean, it's tempting. It's so superficial. You could biopsy it in the clinic to, to facilitate things, but then what are you going to do with the specimen? Yeah, yeah. Well, you got a good pair of running shoes. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. George, periodically, you know, we've seen patients coming in with salmon patches uh, involving their uh, tarsal plates. And we biopsy them, and they they do come out positive for um, lymphoma. Is there any association between the this presentation versus a normal presentation? Um, and are there any ramifications in terms of um, prognosis, systemic involvement, et cetera? Yeah, I think uh, in in these particular in this particular case of an NKT cell lymphoma, the earlier the diagnosis, the better. A lot of malt lymphoma are far more progressive, far more insidious, and um, don't really pretend to a poor prog like life prognosis. Um, and there are a lot of forms of lymphoma on the spectrum of CLL or lymphoma that might be observed for a long time without necessarily intervening. Um, and so um, I think that uh, a case like this one here, these lesions tend to be a lot more aggressive. And um, if, if you saw you know, a, a, an abnormal looking tarsal conjunctiva and you weren't sure if you were going to biopsy it, if, you, if it came back a few weeks later or a month later, it would probably have progressed and you would then probably proceed to biopsy. Um, so I think that uh, the, the malt lymphoma is a far more indolent and less aggressive condition. I tend to biopsy early. I think uh, if it's on the tarsal plate, I mean, it's, it, it, lends itself pretty readily and it comes off quite nicely. Oh, agreed 100%. I do usually combine that with a, you know, consult to oncology to rule out extra, you know, uh, extra locations yeah. of, the, of the lymphoma. Yeah, I had a similar case recently. I won't talk too much about it, but a patient presented with an ectropion and, you know, the, the conjunctiva looked just not quite right. And uh, so I, part of my repair, I was resecting a bit of conjunctiva. So I thought I'll just send it. It's probably just scar keratinization from exposure. And then I had a big surprise. I'm not gonna spoil it because I might tell the story one day, but uh, you know, if you're not sure, um, you know, palpebral conjunctiva tends to be uh, very uh, forgiving to biopsy.
And how often will you see these bilaterally? Um, I think these are relatively rare. I think uh, most of the time they'll present, like I, me I mentioned, 75% uh, of malt lymphomas are a unilateral, are, an, are a single um, a solitary lesion. And so the bilateral is rare, although it's not, it's not that uncommon. I mean, uh, in the, over the course of my fellowship, I think we've had a couple um, and sometimes if you see bilateral, it may not be malt lymphoma, it may be one of the other subsets like mantle lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma or, or, or others. George, there's a question from Dr. Ussel asking whether ultrasound um, targeting the choroid may be useful to rule out intraocular involvement for these cases. Um, I think most of the time that there is intraocular involvement, um, it's, it's quite, it's not very subtle. Um, I've had the unfortunate luck of seeing a similar case during my residency, and they presented with initially an anterior uveitis that progressed into a uh, serous retinal detachment. Um, and so um, usually they're, they're not going to be that subtle. And, and we're not talking about over the course of months they developed. It was really over the course of a week and a bit, a week or two. So um, I, I don't think that, uh, I think an OCT would be very helpful if there are subtle signs of uh, of uh, retinal changes and RPE changes and whatnot, but an ultrasound is probably too gross. And you know, I, I will say, uh, listening to some of the retinal lectures, like Nathan last week, you know, OCT for choroidal imaging is getting more and more advanced. We're learning more, so I think you're probably right on that front. There's no more questions in the chat, so I thank you, George, for. Um, for the, for the wonderful talk this morning. I will ask you to put your contact information back up for the, for the virtual audience. Uh, for those who don't, who don't know George, he's based at Mount Sinai Hospital um, and he started practice there. So his contact information is on the screen. Thank you everyone for joining this week. We are off next week in lieu of Sally Lexin in Ottawa. I will be there. I hope to see some of you guys there, uh, but we will return the week after. Have a good Friday. Thanks for having me. Thank you, George.